Oklahoma is in a unique position. We have had the Republicans ruling us for the last eight years, and we have seen no improvements in any area of our economy, of our social lives, of anything. The eight years prior to that, we were run by Democrats, and it was the exact same thing. It was, we are going to tax you, we are going to increase government programs for special interests, we are going to filter more money to oil and gas, we are going to filter more money to the wind energy, and we're not going to do anything to improve economic conditions that are going to get the 25% of Oklahomans that currently live in poverty out of poverty. We have spent almost two decades taking money from the poor and giving it to special interests. That's something that's got to change. Uh, a lot of people have asked me, you know, you have been a political nomad. You've been all over the place. You've been a Democrat. You've been a Republican. You've been independent. You were Americans elect, one of the seven members of the state party. And now you're a libertarian. So where do you really stand? I've been a libertarian all along. The only thing was there was no libertarian party for me to join. Most of Oklahoma are libertarians. Most Oklahomans want to live their lives. Most Oklahomans don't care what their neighbor does as long as their neighbor's not doing anything to harm them or their property. So the Republican Party has done a very good job of conscripting the idea that they are small government, that they are personal liberty, that they are about freedom. But then I just have to point to two days ago and I have to ask you, how does a $400 billion tax on the poor, or $400 million tax on the poor, strike you? Is that small government? Don't think so. How does increasing government spending by record amounts in four of the seven years that they have been sitting in power in the current session? This isn't a history lesson. This is what we're living right now. The Republican Party long ago left behind any pretense of being individual liberty, of being fiscal responsibility, of being small government. They have joined the Democrats. They are two halves of the same coin. The Libertarian Party came here at the right time because you finally have a small government, fiscally responsible, individual liberty party. And here's the best part of all. You don't even have to hold us accountable because this party's been fighting for these things since 1971. If you haven't participated in any of the online libertarian discussions, you have no idea the firestorm that we come under every time we even begin to drift from the principles. Uh, which, Dr. Crow, that was an excellent introduction. That pretty much encompassed everything that we stand for on a philosophical level. There are a lot of solutions to every problem that Oklahoma is facing today. And I'm going to tell you right now that government is the last of those solutions that you should be considering. Government is the reason that we are in these situations. They do not have any impetus to provide the best environment for the citizens of Oklahoma. All they have to fight for here is donor dollars. If you are a maximum donor, you are going to have an opportunity to get their ear and perhaps sway politics. If you are not, you are meaningless to them. If you don't believe me and you haven't talked to your legislature previously, any of your legislators, your senator, or your house member. Talk to them. Have a conversation. Listen to their justifications. Go home and weigh them against what you already know. Take three minutes. Google the topic and see if it matches up what they have to say. I've done that myself. That's what drove me into the Libertarian Party finally. Well, it's what drove me into the American Select Party. There has got to be a turning point in Oklahoma where we take back control of our government. That's not going to happen with the Democrats. That's not going to happen with the Republicans. That's going to happen with one of the three people sitting up here right now. And here's why. Any of the Republicans that you elect are going to be beholden to the state party to uphold the platform and get as many of their House members reelected as possible so they're not going to tackle any of the tough issues just like Mary Fallon did, did not tackle any of the toughest issues that were facing every Oklahoman until they were forced to. When they were forced to do it, they abandoned their platform, abandoned their principles, 
and ran to the Stenesia solution, which the next day turned around and repealed part of. They can't even stand behind their own packages. Libertarians don't have that problem. We are beholden to no one. We have a platform. That is what we are beholden to. The second we deviate from that platform, we will be censured from the party. The second we deviate from that platform, there are about 150,000 people nationwide that are going to come down on us like a ton of bricks. Several of them are sitting in this room right now. Several of them have had to come down on me like a ton of bricks when I've deviated. And that's another thing that you will find about libertarians that you won't find in either of the old parties. We are real people. We are not politicians. We are not cut and bred from the political cloth. We are not part of the establishment. We are not liked by the establishment because they know the threat we pose. They know that we can bring real change. And that's something that's vitally important, and especially in Oklahoma right now. We have seen the problems that we are facing today, that we have been facing for the last five or six years with our budget. We've known they were coming for 20 years, but it was because of oil and gas, so they weren't going to tackle it. The last five years, we have been in a budget crunch because of the low price of oil, and they are still not willing to tackle it. They are still wanting to send millions and tens of millions of dollars to the oil and gas industry to keep them happy when they are still recording record profits. That has come at the expense of our education system which is ranked 48th in the nation, though we're spending 38th. That has come at the expense of our teachers, who are paid at 48th in the nation. That has come at the expense of public safety, with Tulsa in two different, uh, two different polls. They weren't polls, they were studies, uh, informal studies, the word escapes me at the moment. Ranked as the second most dangerous city as the nation. Tulsa, Oklahoma. It has come at the expense of our infrastructure. I can't talk on speakerphone while I'm going down the street because they can't understand me. That has come at the expense of all of the core functions of government. The only things that government are supposed to provide is the opportunity for you to become the best version of yourself. Whatever that may be, as long as you are not hurting anybody else and you are not causing issues, that's all government is supposed to do. As the current currently exists, that means to make sure that you're safe. That means to make sure that your business can get goods to and from the company. That means to make sure that when your building catches on fire, someone is available to put it out. That means to make sure that your children are educated, whatever means that may be. That's how it exists right now. But they're failing in every single one of those aspects, aren't they? The only way that we are going to fix those is if we start looking at consumer-driven solutions. We are going to have to let parents decide the best way to educate their kid. They know best their child. They know their child's proclivities. They know their desires. They know their inclinations. They are the ones that should be making the decisions, not some artificially drawn school district boundary where they are forced into a 1920s educational model teaching with 1960s, 1970s, 1980s textbooks, that the newest thing that happened was the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded, that they can't tell what the te textbook they're grabbing off of their shelf because the spines are torn off of them. That's not where they're gonna get their education. We have free educational models. Khan Academy, if you've never visited that place, they will get a better education there in one year that then they are going to get in the current educational model in three. The most successful educational model we have in Oklahoma right now is the EPIC public school system, Charter Online Education. They are doing it for half the money, and their students are performing 10% higher, and their teachers are being paid at $61,000 a year on average. That's what happens when you start seeking innovation, when you start seeking better models, when you start seeking consumer-driven solutions. Everything that I am going to propose is going to be a consumer-driven solution. That's just one example, and we are going to improve on everything. Thank you. Can I cuss? No.
just kidding. <laughs> I have a hard time with this filter. All right, I'm not going to sit up here and, and, and lecture you what's wrong with this state and, and who's to blame, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat. They all screwed it up. Okay, you watch the news. You, what's wrong, you know what's wrong with the state. Let's talk this evening about some answers and how we're going to fix it. Okay, what drove me into politics in 2016 is I fought for 20 years since I've been in this state for rights to do what I want to do and own what I want to own. And I laid in bed one night and I said, how does a, a normal person ever get hurt in this country? Because you can fill out all the forms to the senators and the representatives and the president and the secretary of agriculture and everybody else. And if you're lucky, you'll get a form letter back. And if you're lucky. So I woke up the next morning, I filled out my federal papers to run for president of the United States as an independent. And that make it really hard as an independent because you have to go around and get 140,000 signatures in every state. And I made 37 ballots on a $10,000 budget. And what we need in Oklahoma is not a politician. We need somebody up there that's going to hold them hostage and rattle that cage. And it's going to take a business person because Oklahoma has to get on track to sustain itself as a proper business. Right now, they're using you as a slush fund because they don't care. $30 million misappropriated out of the health department and nobody's accountable? They just sweeped it under the rug. It ain't even news anymore. We have over 800 employees and agents with just the Department of Agriculture on an $87 million budget. And they don't do anything. We could stop this teacher walkout. We could fix our infrastructure if we just spent money right. And we moved it around from department to department and got some things done. When I announced that I was running for governor of this state, two weeks before that I went and filled out a food stamp card just to show them how broke their system was. And they gave me $249 a month, and I'm the last person in this room that needs food stamps. And as soon as I announced what their problem was, I turned it in the next day. We have 600,000 people in this state on food stamps. And my own sisters and nieces are on food stamps, and they're the last people that need food stamps. This system is so broke because we don't have any accountability in this state. Unemployment? I bet I've hired 10 people this week. And not one of them showed up for work because all they have to do is go home and punch on a phone that they applied for a job and they get unemployment. We need to have some people answering some phones and we need to put some of these people that are working in these departments to work and get some of these people off of the welfare department that is just screwing the taxpayers. I built the world's largest facility with $1,000. We can put our parks back up. We can get our tourism up, taxing people, $5 another motel room. All we're doing is, is running people off in this state. It gets worse by the day every time they open their mouth. So I think that whether I'm a libertarian or you're a Republican or you're a Democrat, we're all people and we all live in the state of Oklahoma. And it's time we start looking out for each other and it's time we put the state back on track to build itself so we don't have to rely on taxing people. Last thing I'm going to say is, in this state and in any country, you work for the American dream to build your house, buy your property, pay your closing costs, pay your sales tax on everything you use to build that. You dig a pond. You pay to put the water in it. You pay to put the fish in there. And I can't have you come over for a barbecue and throw a hook in my pond without you giving the state $50 for a fishing license. You never own anything. And it's time that stops. And that's all I got to say, Chris. Your turn. First off, I want to thank uh, USAO for having this event and to thank all of you for coming out. Uh, USAO, uh, I had a nephew that graduated from here. And unlike some of our larger higher education institutions, uh, he graduated from here and took that uh, degree and immediately went to work putting that degree to use. 
uh, and I think that's something that's uh, that's really a positive about a higher education institution that is not necessarily the case everywhere else. Uh, I'd also uh, like to mention that the last time we had a libertarian presidential candidate come and visit the state of Oklahoma, USA <coughs> hosted Michael Bednarik in 2004. So I certainly uh, certainly appreciate this fine institution. And the city of Chickasha, uh, when my great-grandfather and his brothers came from Fort Smith into the Indian Territory, one brother moved on from there into the Oklahoma Territory and settled here in Chickasha, Alfred Powell. So uh, I've got some connections to this area, and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you again for hosting us. My name's Chris Powell. I'm a libertarian. I've been a libertarian for a long time, and I'm delighted that we are participating in a gubernatorial election for the first time as a party, and that we are having a primary for that gubernatorial election. Regardless of the fact that we're trying to beat each other, and we are, you know, we do have differences, the fact that we are having this primary and it's, we're, uh, it is a legitimately contested primary is doing wonders for us as a party. It's getting us this kind of attention. Uh, and it's one of the hardest things about being a libertarian in the state has been the fact that people don't know we exist. So all of that to get the word out that we're actually here, we're actually a thing, and we're actually going to be on your ballot for you to vote for to be able to say, I don't want that big government establishment party or that big government establishment party. I want individual liberty and personal responsibility. I appreciate all of that to uh, let the voters know that that exists. As uh, Dr. Crow mentioned about uh, in talking about the Libertarian Party, that's what we're about. Individual liberty, uh, civil rights, your right to live the way that you choose re as, so long as you harm no one else without having politicians from the state capitol dictate to you how that's going to be. So if that's a message that resonates with you, here we are. Uh, <clears throat> probably the, uh, the best way to explain some of that uh, is to look at what's been going on in the past few days at the state capitol with the, with the teacher pay and all of that stuff. We have a situation where uh, the, the state legislature passed a package, uh, a revenue package, to increase taxes on the people of Oklahoma. And there's some parts of that where some of that taxation is becoming more equal, uh, like the fuel tax, it's, there's not going to be an advantage for diesel over gasoline now. Some of that equality before the law is positive, but for the most part, it is taking more from the people of Oklahoma to put through the government process without prioritizing spending. We've had budget shortfalls, we've had across the board budget cuts uh, to several agencies, but we haven't really had thoughtful prioritization of spending. And that's why we can't fund our core services. We have $450 million that in incentives that is reviewed by the Incentive Evaluation Commission, a process that they can't do in one year, by the way. It takes four years for them to review all the incentives that we have, and they've hardly touched any of it. The Incentive Evaluation Commission rubber stamps it, and it goes on and goes on and goes on while our core services are not being funded. Was that talked about this, past, uh, this week in the legislature? No, of course not. Uh, instead, we have a situation where government employees, teachers, teachers who should be more jealously trying to protect their autonomy in the classroom and trying to take back some of that control from the legislature, going up there with their hat in hand saying, well, actually not with their hat in hand, they're, uh, they're ready to uh, stay up there and demand, demand, demand until they get a pay raise. And it's very justifiable that they, that they want a pay raise. I don't think there's anybody in this state, certainly not anybody running for office, who's going to say that they don't deserve more money. But by putting all of that control in the hands of the state legislature, they further cement the political control of the classroom. 
as long as our classrooms ha uh, uh, and our students have testing dictated to them, curriculum dictated to them, all of these rules and regulations so that the only thing that, the, that is decided in the local school is which day is Chili Mac Day, then we're never going to put the control back in the hands of our teachers who know how to run classrooms. It's never going to be within reach of parents whose children are in those classrooms. It's going to continue to be decided by 150 politicians in a building down in Oklahoma City. So we need to, and this is libertarianism 101, we need to push that authority and responsibility away from the circus big top at 23rd and Lincoln and back towards you, the people, so that you have more control. When Joe talks about f sending off uh, missives to his various rep federal and state uh, elected officials and not getting anything in return, it's a lot easier to go down and talk to the, your school board representative than it is to get into your state representative and especially to get to your federal representative or your senator. It's a lot easier to go talk to your city councilman. It's a lot easier to run against your city councilman. And I'm sure we can all attest to the uh, difficulty when you get to the higher levels of office in trying to do something like communicate to you know, over 100,000 voters in this state uh, when we can make change at the local level but w as a party, we have to run for all these offices. In fact, if we don't get a certain number of votes, if whoever, whichever one of us gets nominated doesn't get a no certain number of votes, they'll kick us off the ballot. And if we're too successful, this is what they did in 1974, which kept us off the ballot for so many years, uh, if, we're too, if an alternative party is too successful, they'll raise the threshold so that we can't get back on the ballot. So one of the things that we're trying to do is not just promote liberty, not just push authority and responsibility back down to the local level within your reach. We are also trying to build the Libertarian Party so that we will be a permanent fixture in the Oklahoma political landscape and they can't change the law enough to run us off. So certainly if you have, you know, if you want to find something with which you can disagree with one of us or with the party platform, you can certainly find it. Uh, one of my mentors, uh, Tom Laurent, who was uh, a longtime fixture of the party before he retired, told me that if you put two libertarians in a room discussing something, you'll get at least three opinions. That is certainly true. Uh, we are a contentious bunch. Uh, so if you see something that you don't like, rest assured there's somebody else in the party that also sees it that way. And if you see lots of things that you don't like from the two establishment parties, we need your help. We need your support. We need your votes. And we need to build an alternative to the two establishment parties who simply accrue more and more power to themselves at 23rd and Lincoln and at Washington, D.C. So that's what I'm about. And I certainly appreciate you being here. And I look forward to answering your questions. So our first question is going to be about the budget. <clears throat> and this will go to all the, all the candidates, and, and we'll, we'll start with you, Mr. Maldonado. <clears throat> Excuse me. In light of repeated state revenue shortfalls, what changes will you pursue to develop responsible fiscal policy? You, we, we're going to have to get every department and every agency on a budget. Okay? We have to make them accountable just like I was using in, a, in my opening statement. We have the Department of Agriculture has $87 million budget, okay? And then we have the USDA has 360 agents of its own in the state of Oklahoma doing the same damn thing, but none of them do anything, okay? And if we can lift some of these agents and, and some of these departments and, and shovel money around, just like if you were building a house and you needed to borrow money to put it in your garage, okay, that we wouldn't have a budget shortfall. Missing $30 million at a time in one department is absurd. Just think how many other departments we're losing that much money in. 
along with the programs that people are scamming in this state. And I believe that we could fix this problem just by managing money. And we have Gary Jones running for governor, and he's a state auditor. <laughs> it's the last one we need in there. <laughs> if he can't keep track of the money now, what the hell is he going to do when he's governor? But we got we got to get on a budget, and we have to make this state make its own money. And instead of closing state parks down and running tourists off, we need to be bringing tourists in the state and building our parks back up. And I think we can. It's just it's simple mathematics if you know how to run a business. And Oklahoma needs to be a business instead of taxing everybody every time. The politicians up there screw up. You know, we don't have any money to give teachers right now, but they gave 25 of their aides a $127,000 raise. They don't care about any of us because it's not their money. We could give those teachers a $5,000 pay raise by taking $5,000 off of every senator and House of Representatives paycheck every year. And they still make over $100,000 a year. It's all about spending, but as long as they're the ones making the laws and passing all this tax stuff, it, it'll never change. Never. So we've got to run this state like a business. Well, I think uh, some of the things that we can do, I, I mentioned it in my opening statement, is look at the numerous incentives that we have that are have been ignored in these years of repeated budget shortfalls. Uh, we have the uh, film rebate that we give out where we pay movie makers to come here and make movies that often are a bit denigrating to the people of Oklahoma. So uh, that certainly, you know, and there's, like I said, $450 million worth of programs like this where we give tax credits or rebates or outright subsidies to various corporate interests. And this is done, of course, in the name of economic development. Something else that's done in the name of economic development is uh, tax increment, increment financing districts. What that does is it robs our local schools and our county governments of local money that they would otherwise use for operating in order to put it into so-called economic development. And what most of these economic pro development pro programs are is really crony capitalism. It's handouts to preferred businesses, preferred by the politicians, and typically they, what they do is they poach jobs from neighboring communities. And that doesn't, that's not growth. You know, robbing your neighbor down the street does not make either one of you wealthier in the long run. So we can, we can certainly put a lot of money back in the state budget by ending ta tax increment financing districts and by getting rid of some of these uh, incentives. And we can also look at consolidation of some of our state agencies. We have, uh, I believe, uh, if I remember correctly, the number is 231 different state agencies. Uh, we've got the Department of Agriculture, but we also have a sorghum commission and a bull weevil eradication commission and a wheat commission. And I, you know, for the life of me, I can't figure out why these are separate entities aside from the Department of Agriculture. Now, perhaps those, those agencies are not getting a whole lot of state money, uh, but again, they don't need to be getting anything and they should be put in the Department of Agriculture. They're still gonna have staff, they're still gonna have people appointed to it. Uh, with our state law enforcement agencies. And in fact, uh, the state legislature has actually moved a little bit on that to uh, do some consolidation of that. If you look at uh, McAllister, the Department of Public Safety has an office there. The, o the Bureau of Narcotics has an office there. The State Bureau of Investigation has an office there. Uh, there's one other that I can't think of the uh, other one there, but there's there's at least four different state law enforcement agencies that have an office in McAllister when they could all be in one and save us some money. And we can put these entities together. The other thing that uh, w that 
that sort of consolidation. The other advantage is, is that when their role can be reduced, if they're their own separate agency, they're going to fight and claw for every little piece of it. But if they're part of a larger agency, it's a little bit easier to absorb that. You can move those personnel to another part of the agency. You don't have to lay anybody off. And it's easier to reduce a, a larger state agency than these individual ones that keep a hold of every piece of their turf. Uh, so certainly uh, I agree with Joe that we need to pass state question 788 and stop looking at uh, issues with intoxicating substances as a reason to arrest people. That is not a problem that you will ever, ever arrest your way out of. Uh, as libertarians, we certainly believe that as long as you're not harming anybody else, what you do with your body is your business. And that certainly applies with cannabis. Uh, there's certainly a lot of medical uses that people have fled the state uh, over cannabis, and we need to pass that. Not just because people have the right to live as the, way, the way they choose, but it's backing our prisons. So when we start treating some of this mental illness that becomes criminal issues as mental illness rather than something to throw uh, people into a legal system that makes them worse than when they started and piles on the fees and makes it so that it's virtually impossible to become a productive citizen again. That's the way out of this. Uh, as uh, one of the things that I would, int would look at on the very first day as governor is to look at the people in our prison system who are there for substance abuse who did not commit a crime against another person and see how we can get those, uh, those people out of the system. Our pardon and parole board, uh, you can't just, the governor doesn't just have the power to pardon anybody. It's got to go through the pardon and parole board, uh, but we need to address that system so that we can get those people out of a place that they don't belong. Thank you. Mr. Lawhorn? I said from the beginning from on my first day in office that I'm going to ask that parole board to give me a list of everybody that is currently serving time in the state of Oklahoma that does not have a crime against another individual either the person or the property and I was going to submit a request for pardon to that board for them to review and get those people out of prison immediately um, there are multiple reasons for this but none more important than the moral aspect of it you have no business putting people in prison for smoking a plant we need to stop putting people in jail that we don't like and start putting people in jail that we're afraid of when you have a child rapist that gets 15 years probation um, because they don't have their total vision because they're legally blind and you have 50 people sitting in prison in the state of Oklahoma because they were smoking a plant that grows in the cracks of the state then uh, you've got serious concerns about the judicial system in the state um, the second thing that I would do regarding this particular issue is to change, get with the judicial board and change sentencing guidelines and make sure that we don't keep putting people in prison for doing things that don't hurt anybody else or their property that are just basic economic factors that they should be able to engage in on their own as long as they're not hurting anybody else or hurting anybody else's property. And we have laws to cover that. Um, 788 absolutely needs to be passed and immediately it needs to be expanded into full recreational um, this is going to have multiple effects one it's going to get people out of prison that don't belong in prison uh, number two it's going to get the 65 percent of the people the nonviolent offenders that are in Oklahoma prisons with mental illness into a true mental health treatment program which is going to save the state roughly hundred and ten thousand dollars a year per prisoner per prisoner 65 percent of the people sitting in oklahoma jails right now are nonviolent and are being treated for mental illness which is likely the cause of the reason that they wound up in jail what caused them to get them sideways with the law there are a lot of things that need to change but as governor the most important things are to make sure that we utilize the pardon system and that we utilize our influence in moving forward with the law and uh, 
not criminalizing people that aren't hurting anybody else and not hurting their property. What do you believe is the proper relationship between state and federal government? <laughs> <laughs> if elected, what kinds of partnerships with the federal government will you seek or avoid in order to promote the well-being of Oklahoma citizens? The federal government is involved in far too many things. They're, uh, they've got their fingers in the pie of our schools. They, are, they give us restrictions on what we can do with environmental policy. They control our transportation system through highway funding. Uh, they have their fingers in all the pies. And that needs to be uh, we need to push back against that, uh, you know, it, and because they use those things to get what they want in such a way that they get a lot more control for the amount of, uh, with a smaller amount of money than any other funding source for for our government programs. Uh, you can look at uh, the amount of say that the federal government has in our schools and it is way outsized compared to the amount of money that is actually getting to the schools from the federal government. It's also the case that with all of these programs that if you're sending your tax dollars off to Washington so th and then they turn around and send some of it back, that's what you're getting. You're getting some of it back. You send off a dollar and you get a quarter. Well, if we just kept that here in the first place, even though some states get more than others and some states get less, if we all kept it in our individual states in the first place, we would have a lot more to spend on our local infrastructure and our local education and our local health care and all of those things. So I would definitely seek to push back against federal control of state policy and to work to reduce the amount of funding that is coming into uh, the state from federal sources that comes with a bunch of control along with it. If we don't push back against the federal government uh, in this way, it, then at a, at a certain point, states will be, we're pretty close to there now, there'll be little more than super counties with all of the, the decisions made by those remote people off in Washington, D.C. that you can't possibly go and see face to face unless you're making huge contributions to their, to their political campaigns. So as governor, I would stand up against the federal government at every opportunity. It would take, uh, it would require a great deal of care and it would require picking your battles, but mm -hmm we have to start pushing back against uh, the overarching growth of the federal government or we're all going to be uh, subject to the whims of the people of much larger states such as california and texas and new york uh, ruling every little bit of our lives even more than they already do now to answer this question i'm going to give you my vision of the purpose of the constitution a lot of people say that the constitution is what gives us our rights right that it's the bill of rights that's what says what you are allowed to do and what you are allowed not to do. That's not the case. The Bill of Rights exists to reaffirm rights that you have simply because you exist. As a human being, you are entitled to those rights. It doesn't matter where you're from, what you're doing. And the Bill of Rights is an affirmation of that, not a granting of. So in the 10th Amendment of the Constitution, it says specifically that anything that is not specifically given to the federal government is reserved for the states, that it's for us to decide what is best for our families, for our communities, not to be dictated by 23rd and Lincoln, or by Washington, D.C., Pennsylvania Avenue. So what's happened over the course of 200 years is the Supreme Court has nibbled chunk by chunk away from the state in the name of the public welfare, the common good, right? Because that's what it says in the base of the Constitution. Um, 
that's gotten way out of hand and it's what happens in societies over the course of time because generations pass, right? We don't know what it was like. We can't, don't have a memory of what it was like in 1777 when we first got our freedom and we were all about living our lives in economic opportunity, helping our brother part of the community. We don't have that memory inside of us. So all we know is from the time that we were born and we know that we started under a time when the federal government had already massively encroached beyond what the Tenth Amendment was meant to shield us from. And, but then a wonderful thing happened. We invented computers. And computers got in everybody's home and we could start seeing all of these encroachments all across the nation. Uh, you know, we've always heard of stories, you know, of neighborhoods, of certain police departments or certain school boards or certain county commissions that were bullying their people in one way or another. You know, we've heard those stories but they were never really kind of real because they were in a town two states over. Now it shows up on your Facebook feed first thing in the morning. So we are much more aware of those issues now than we were before. And what it's led to is an environment where people recognize that the government, not just the federal government, but the state government has encroached so far beyond what it was originally intended to do that it's time to take it back, to become the government again that is done for the people by the people. So specifically to your question of what partnerships I would seek with the federal government, the only thing that I would seek from the federal government is a return to the state of Oklahoma, the funds that they have taken in the form of taxes. And I don't want a quarterback for every dollar. I want my people to have every dollar back because they would use that money to help their neighbors. They would use that money to build our infrastructure, to educate our children, not subsidize California. The situations that I would avoid would be any voluntarily task where we have to sacrifice state sovereignty in order to receive some type of benefit from the federal government. If it's not one that we're paying for, if we're not going to get our money back for it, I would avoid it like the plague. If this federal government tried to come in and impose something that I knew that was beyond what the people of this state wanted, and secondly, beyond what the Constitution permitted, I would ask them to leave. If they refuse to do so, I would ask the sheriffs of our counties to ask them to leave. If they refuse to do so, I would ask the National Guard to ask them to leave because the federal government has already gone too far and taken too much away from the state of Oklahoma to, for us to allow them to go anymore. We're already suffering. We can't let them let us suffer anymore. Not a friend of the federal government. Whatever you do, don't say Waco on TV because they will search your computers. <laughs> You don't even have the freedom of speech with the federal government. What, the, the, this, again, is a small problem that's going to have to be started at the ground up. Every time we accept money from the federal government, we're going to owe them something. Okay? We need to be sustainable on our own to where we can say no to the federal government. Right now... <laughs> We couldn't say no to the federal government, especially if we had an emergency in this state, because we're broke. They've, they've ruined it. But if we can build Oklahoma back up and make this state where it can sustain itself, we wouldn't have to live off the federal government. But the big thing about the federal government and what we can do with our law enforcement in this state is... 90% of the public doesn't realize that your sheriff has more power than the President of the United States does. He's the oldest elected official in our country, elected by the people of his county to protect them from the federal government. And if the ATF or the FBI or the USDA or somebody wanted to come in and seize your property, it is their real doing sworn duty to arrest them and to protect your property and you from the federal government. But the problem with most small towns, especially ours, our sheriff's department doesn't know anything about computer crimes or anything. So who's the first person they call? The federal government to come help them out because if the FBI is in town, it's fun. So we gotta get our own law enforcement trained to protect the citizens of, of the state of Oklahoma. And then we can start weaning ourselves away from the federal government because we really don't need them, but we've got to get us on track first. And this is going to be a building process. This ain't going to happen in the first 
four years of, of anybody winning in this office. But we can do it. If you had to choose one method with which to fund state government, what would it be and why? And then also, and what method do you consider to be the most immoral? My personal uh, most disliked is the income tax because to me that's a tax on existing. You either have an income or you're dependent on somebody else who has an income or you're a recipient of what is taken from people who have an income. So uh, to me, a tax on just existing, uh, I, I strongly dislike that. Uh, there are many libertarians who don't like the property tax uh, with justification. The, the fact that if you don't pay your taxes on your, on your house that you own outright, you've paid off your mortgage, but if you don't pay your taxes, the state will come and take it away from you. Are those taxes not essentially rent that you must pay to the state to own what should be your property? If it's yours, you should be able to do what you want with it. So those are both problematic. Uh, what most libertarians would prefer to do is move to Stop. as funding as much of government as is necessary by user fees and voluntary taxation of one kind or another. Uh, cons uh, another, um, another favorite is consumption taxes. Sales tax is an example of consumption tax. Uh, you, know, you don't pay it unless you go buy something. So that's certainly uh, something that where you have control over how much you pay uh, and how much you, you give into that. Uh, the lottery is an example of a voluntary tax. Nobody's required to play the lottery. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Revolutionary War was funded uh, in part by lotteries. Uh, and then uh, user fees, uh, that's if you use a government service, you pay a fee for it, that's pretty self-explanatory. But even something like uh, your fuel taxes, if your fuel taxes are used for just for maintaining and building roads, then that serves as a, a user tax. So those kinds of things over, over which the consumer, uh, the user of the services, would have some control uh, and would have some choice as to whether they partake in it or not, uh, that's, that's the direction that I think we need to move. Uh, because, like I said, with an income tax, I guess that's a tax on existing, and a property tax, that means you're paying rent to own your property to the state. So that's that would be my answer to that. I agree that the most immoral form of taxation is the income tax because everybody has to have an income just to survive because of the type of economy that we have. Um, my answer for what would be the most moral, how would I choose to fund government, I'm going to frame in the context of our current economy and our current political climate. And that would be through a sales tax on non-sustenance items and a user fee uh, on other resources. For instance, the turnpikes would be an example of the user fee. If you are going to drive on the turnpike and utilize that resource, you would be part of the contributor to that. Um, the Back on the sales tax, everybody has to eat. If you have children, you have to give them diapers. Um, that is not voluntary. Those are things that you do not have the option to choose not to do. Um, you should not be taxed for items that you have to do just to survive because you have the God-given right to your life. Uh, and it's sort of loathsome to have to discuss about it in this context because pretty much everything that you buy, everything that you do, is under the auspices of you choosing what to do with your valuable resources. You have worked hard. You have earned your income. You have the right to determine how that income is to be used. And when you have any type of taxation where they take your money involuntarily and spend it how they see fit and not what you choose to use it for, however, in our current climate, we don't have another method. You can't say, well, I'm gonna charge you a tax for using the grocery store or using the college. We do kind of do that with tuition, but uh, 
So a combination of the sales tax and user fees on other items. In the perfect world, most of the services that we enjoy today that are provided by the federal government would be provided from the private industry. Our turnpikes would be a truly private company that is the public is accountable or that is accountable to the public that don't hide behind state bonds with mysterious bondholders that you can't even see where their money's coming from or where their money's going. Um, the OTA needs to be turned loose. Another thing would be that the parks, um, Joe's got a great zoo. He's got another park that's run by the state just a few miles down the road at Turner Falls that they were threatening to close on us even though you have paid for it already and that it is being held in trust for you that we're gonna deny you access to it. Shouldn't be that way. They should be on contract with the state to be a private company that maintains that park for the benefit of all Oklahomans and they have to meet the minimum requirement is that they hold those public trusts open and available to all people who choose to visit it. Has multiple functions. One, it's going to improve the services that are provided at these facilities. Number two, it's going to increase our tourism, which happens to be our third largest industry in the state of Oklahoma. So those are the types of things that you would see user fees for that would be perfectly moral because you can choose to go to the park or you can choose not to go to the park. That is a voluntary contribution back to the state for the function of maintaining something that you are enjoying the use of. I'm going to take this a little direction, <laughs> different direction. It's paid by the tax department, but the two most immoral ones that I disagree with is employment tax and, and Social Security. Taken out of your check. I would like to make it a free will state. If you go to work for somebody and you choose to have unemployment taken out of your check, that's fine. But if you never intend on filing unemployment because you're a career motivated person or you can figure out just how to work and make your money on your own, why the hell should you be paying the state? I've paid this unemployment for almost 55 years. And I have never drawn unemployment. And if my employer could save matching that, he could afford to pay more. He could hire more. And it's the same way with Social Security. We have robbed $3.7 trillion out of people's paychecks for Social Security that's gone. It'll never come back because they misappropriated it, misspent it. And it's, and it's out there. So we need, as people, to be able to make that choice. If I want to have a savings account, I'll open my own damn savings account for when I'm 65 years old. And if I want to draw unemployment, let, let the state have my money. But if I want to work for a living, I'd rather have it in my paycheck now than let a bunch of politicians swindle my money away. Free will tax. You go, you go to the movies. You go anywhere else that you enjoy, and pay sales tax. That's your choice. But being made to pay tax to work, slave days aren't over, folks. <laughs> you emphasize uh, individual liberty and personal responsibility, so long as no harm is done to others. I am curious about the libertarian stance and about each of your individual stances on the potential to harm for individuals, especially as it relates to gun access. What laws should be in place, if any, to restrict potentially dangerous individuals from acquiring dangerous weapons? Potentially dangerous, dangerous individuals has not done anything to anybody and have not done anything to your property. Every single person sitting in this room is a potentially dangerous individual under the right circumstances. If somebody is breaking into your house and threatening your children, I guarantee you, you are going to become a dangerous individual in a hurry. And that's a situation that we need to be thinking about because there is not going to be anything, no law, no policy, no government program ever that is going to keep you safe from harm. There is never going to be any government agency, program, tax, law, policy that is going to give you the opportunity to defend yourself. Uh, 
there's been a lot of conversation lately about the Second Amendment and how it is used or how it was meant to be used, you know, for militia and we don't need militias anymore. Tell that to the people that are killed in the streets on a daily basis. All over the country, happens right here in Oklahoma. Tell that to the innocent people that were pulled over by police officers here in Oklahoma, or up in Oklahoma City, raped and left in a ditch by a police officer that they didn't have the right to defend themselves. I understand the concern. Uh, Chris and I are both Desert Storm veterans. We've seen violence. Chris works with the police department. He has heard the mentally ill, the potentially dangerous that they're concerned about. The solution doesn't come from limiting their access because you can't limit their access. That kid that went into the high school and shot those people in Parkland shouldn't have been able to have the gun to begin with. He wouldn't have been able to have the gun to begin with if the safeguards that are already in place had been followed. And it's situations like that that reinforce the need for you to be able to defend yourself. Because this kid was reported ahead of time on credible threats, saying that he was going to go kill people. And neither the local police nor the federal police did anything. Once he actually made good on his threat and went into that school and started killing kids, the people with the guns that we expected to protect us stood outside while he killed kids until the shooting stopped. The only thing that is going to prevent that type of situation from happening is an equally armed individual with good intentions on the other side. There should be no restrictions to people having access to items used in self-defense for the simple reason is there is nobody that can defend you except yourself. Oh, my, I'm going to make it short because you, <laughs> you don't need 10 minutes of this. We, we have to take care of mental health, which means we have to take care of a stronger background check. I could give a rat's ass about bump stocks. Shot one two weeks ago. You couldn't hit a tanker truck if you had a bump stock, okay? That, 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 nobody's going to die without a bump stock. You ain't taking my AR. And raising the limit's not going to keep anybody alive to 21. I hate to tell you. But it all goes back to just, just what Rex said. There, there's nobody that responds to anything. I got a 46-year-old crazy bastard in Norman, Oklahoma with two little babies and a wife, and that man shows up everywhere I go. That's why I got a police officer standing back there. And I have filed charges with the FBI, the ATF, the OSBI, and the Norman police, and nobody, nobody has even called me back. We have to to get these people off their ass and take care of these crazy people. And, and a pill's not going to help, okay? You, you can't just keep shoving Xanax to, to, to people that need help. I don't know if any of you know what Red Rock is over there in Norman, okay? I tried, I tried to commit one of my own in, in seven facilities, okay? There's no room because there's no funding. You have to literally stand in front of a cop and threaten to kill yourself to get help in this state. Taking guns away ain't going to help nothing. We got to get our law enforcement to do their jobs, and we got to take care of the mental health, and we got to let people have the right to protect themselves. But the way our politics and our judicial system is in this state, I'd be scared to hell to defend myself and shoot somebody and face our judicial system in this state because you're not you're not innocent until proven guilty anymore. I hate to tell you. Okay, you are prosecuted on Facebook and on the news. So let's let's solve the problem where it's where it starts and, and that's mental health, not taking care not taking away your guns. You can get a hunter safety card at what, fourteen? Sixteen years old? To to go pheasant hunting and stuff? Those kids that live out in the country and do that have done nothing wrong. So why take their rights away? 
Well, one of the things that needs to be uh, understood about some of these uh, events that we've seen with what we would call troubled individuals who carry out some kind of attack is that they are exceedingly rare. Now, every time they happen, they get covered, they get wall-to-wall -wall coverage on the, in the media for you know, sometimes weeks at a time, and people with political agendas try to use those events to advance their agenda, but those are incredibly rare. The vast majority of instances where somebody uh, is killed by somebody else who has a gun are in instances like we hear about in Chicago and Baltimore, where it is uh, individual on individual crime, not some troubled person who makes a random attack. So we don't need to be trying to make policy uh, to address all of this based on incredibly rare events uh, that uh, that's not a good way to make policy. Uh, to put it in statistical terms, 3% uh, of homicides of minors uh, committed with a gun occur at school. The other 97% are happening somewhere else and have nothing to do with these kind of attacks that we see covered ad nauseum by the, by the media because it draws viewers. Uh, now, one thing that, uh, that I would consider as far as dealing with those very rare individuals who are troubled and may pose a threat to others is something that, uh, shockingly, comes out of California. Um, it's uh, a gun violence restraining order. They've enacted that in California, and basically what a person can do is they can contact the offices that that handle that and say, I think this person is a danger and may, may do something and perhaps you should look at restricting their gun rights. But it can't be just anybody. You can't do it to your neighbor just because you're mad about something with your property line. It has to be somebody that's very close to the individual. There's also a court hearing that is involved and that has to take place very quickly uh, before anything is done. Uh, because if you're going to take somebody's rights away, it should go through a legal process before a judge rather than just willy-nilly uh, because somebody said something. And the results, even in California, have been that you can have uh, very few of these done. I believe the last year that uh, they, we have numbers for, they had 86 in one year. So this is not something that, at least so far, has been used widely to restrict the rights of a lot of people. And it's a process that is not about the item. It's not about the object. It's about the individual, an individual who probably seriously needs help. And this is an avenue where they can get that. So I think that that is something that is worth considering. Uh, but if you want to look at broad-based restrictions on the rights of everybody, uh, then I certainly can't agree with that. If libertarianism is about respecting individual rights, can you justify abortion as it infringes on the rights of unborn children? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I had my own condoms back here on the table, okay? Just help yourself. <laughs> First of all, you got to understand, I'm openly gay, so kids is not my thing anyway. All right? But you can have them, but you're going to take care of them. All right? And, and, and that's, where, that's where a lot of people get confused about being a libertarian, okay? Everybody wants their rights to make their choices, but when you can't pay for it, it's up to the taxpayer and the government to take care of the problem. So I'm I'm pro-choice all the way. Uh, you, uh, uh, I think we have laws that say that, that it has to be within a certain trimester already. So it's not somebody with voting rights, okay? So it's your body, your choice. But being pro-choice, 
I also can take it a step further. And if you're going to use abortion for a, a, a reason to be sloppy or lazy, because you can't strap one on or be responsible, hey, I, I know libertarians aren't supposed to be in for passing laws, but you need to have your tubes tied after the first one because it's not an excuse. It's called being responsible. Prohibition, and we have seen plenty of examples of this uh, in all kinds of different aspects of human life. Uh, prohibition, in my view, does not work. And if you try to prohibit abortions, in my view, you're probably going to have a situation well, you're, you're, it's going to be something like what we had before Roe v. Wade, where there are things happening in back alleys and things like that. I think the result would not be very good. However, uh, and Rex mentioned the Tenth Amendment earlier, I'm a firm believer in the Tenth Amendment, and I think the uh, that's a, a very key issue for me. I don't think that the decision should be made at the at the federal level it should be a state decision now we all probably have a pretty good idea what this state would decide and i can't say that i would necessarily like that very much uh, but if we have a representative uh, a democratic republic system that's probably going to be the be the result uh, but like I said, if we if we are going to adhere to the Bill of Rights, then we have to adhere to all of it, and that includes the Tenth Amendment, and that's something that should be decided at the state level. And one of the things that, one of the things about libertarians is that uh, we believe that you have you should be free to do as you choose, so long as you harm no other. And some of those choices are going to be bad. If you, some of those choices are, you know, if people make bad choices every day. I'm sure every one of you can think of a bad choice that you yourself have made very recently. I don't, <laughs> I can't, uh, <clears throat> I can't say that I would be very happy with the choice that I think Oklahoma would make, but I think our state and every other state has a right to make that choice. Up until probably the last four or five years, you would have called me. Uh, you know, pro-life. Uh, that was one of the things that attracted me to the Republican Party after the Democrat Party was the fact that it did, you know, preserve the sanctity of life uh, for whatever that meant. But that was because I was uneducated, and that was because I was arrogant, and I believed with absolute certainty that I had the right to make the decision for everybody else and be the ultimate deciding factor on when life began on when a person's humanity began to exist. And I dealt with a lot of pro-choice people over the course of my life, and more so when I got into the Libertarian Party. Uh, we're split, probably about 50-50 right down the middle, half pro-life, pro-choice. But I have modified and created my own category, and I'll explain it afterward. I am anti-abortion. We had prohibition of abortion for 80 years. It didn't stop it. It was illegal nationwide. It was illegal in every situation, in every county, every city. And it didn't stop. It still happened. What it did do is drive it into the shadows and hide the problem. In more recent years, the dialogue between the left and right, the two extreme versions that controls everything that we see in the media and that controls the online conversations, has become so vitriolic that we haven't been able to have a good, honest conversation about when does life begin? What is the standard that we are going to establish that is going to say this is the point in which a person is entitled to human rights? Some people say conception. They have very good reasons for saying that. They have good scientific reasons. They have good uh, religious reasons. They have good philosophical reasons. Some people are going to say that it's further along and they are going to have religious, scientific, and social reasons for that. Some people are going to say at birth and they are going to have 
valid religious scientific reasons for that. And the problem with trying to determine at what point a person deserves their right to life is that you're never going to get agreement until science and religion can agree at the point in which it happens. Religion itself doesn't agree on it. A lot of people say at conception, but what most people don't realize is that a lot of the great thinkers of the 18th century said that human life doesn't exist until the quickening, which is sometime after conception when God gives the soul to the child. And they didn't even specify when it was. Some said that it was not long after. Some said that it was once the heart started beating. Some said it once the brain started going. So not even religion can agree at not what point we attain our human status. Um, I believe that we need to err on the side of caution, but prohibition didn't do that for us. It didn't solve it. It didn't stop it. The only way that you are going to stop these issues is by making it the least attractive alternative. Right now, it is the easiest thing for them to do in the case of an unwanted pregnancy. Putting kids up for adoption is a pain. Um, we don't have the technology yet to transfer embryos to another patient that wants it. Eventually, the time is going to come where science is going to solve this problem for us because we're going to be able to take that embryo and implant it in a host or in an artificial environment and allow that child to continue to develop to whatever they have the potential to become. But until that point comes, this is going to be something that everybody is going to have to agree to disagree on because nobody can provide a solid answer with unequivocal evidence that that is the point at which life begins. I believe that Oklahoma's laws are some of the most stringent in the nation, you know, 20 weeks, and anything after that is only in medical emergency. And I believe that with the current body of knowledge that we have that that's where the laws need to stay but that's not going to end abortion what's going to end abortion is making it the least attractive alternative socially thank you all for having us here tonight it was a pleasure to be able to speak to you thank you for everybody at home that's going to see this video later or that's seeing it on live stream now um, you have an opportunity for change in Oklahoma this year you've heard three similar but differing perspectives you've got other choices in the two old parties which you know are pretty much the two sides of the same coin they've been trying to do it for decades now and you see where we're sitting give the new kids the opportunity we've got good ideas we've got the knowledge we've got the education and we've got the support to make it happen thank you hi uh, thanks for the invitation it, it was an honor being here and i appreciate everybody coming you know uh i i have no filter I, and I'm not scared to go up there and hold them hostage. And that's what needs to happen because the people that have been running this state uh, has run us into the ground. And uh, I'm pretty much, what you see is what you get. Ain't a shame to how I put it out there. Um, we, we have to get this state to sustain itself. If I can get anything across to you, it has to be run like a business not a bank where, where you're the the donors okay we can do it it's just going to take some business people up there instead of some lobbyists and special interest groups that are buying off your politicians and making those three million dollar campaign donations when you look at somebody's campaign fund and they're loaning themselves eight hundred thousand dollars for a two hundred thousand dollar job that should wake you up right there to tell you that they're not in it for you. There's, there's a rainbow and a cup, pot of gold at the other end of that brick there somewhere. So, which either one of us win, I, I think either one of us out of the three here would, would look out for your, your rights as, as human beings and citizens of the state of Oklahoma. Thank you. My name's Chris Powell, and I'm a libertarian running for governor. And... What my goal is to build a party that stands for individual liberty and will work to protect your rights and advance your freedom in the state of Oklahoma. And in November, when one of us three will be on the ballot for governor, there will be a lot of other libertarian candidates that will be on ballots all across this state. 
and that's what all of us are going to be working towards and all the people that are going to help our campaigns all of the people that are going to donate and all the other people that are going to all the people across this state that are going to vote for us on their ballots that's what we're about advancing individual liberty for each and every one of you so come november if you want something different from the power mongering to establishment parties here we are in the meantime if you want to help us make november as good as it can be find a libertarian candidate and help them thank you to usao for hosting us uh, thank you dr crow and thank you everyone for coming